Join me as we travel the country and explore licensing to see what it means for the everyday worker. I'm Dick Carpenter, and this is License to Work. It's 1965, and a young Navy veteran and factory worker needs a side job to support his growing family. He hits upon an idea, a painting business. It takes no special training and little initial investment, only about $250. For almost a decade, he paints houses, barns, signs, businesses, anything people ask for. And each year, he brings in an extra five grand, or in today's dollars, about $39,000. That young Navy veteran was my father. Today, if I want to do the same thing, it would not be nearly as easy. In a lot of states, I'd have to jump through multiple hoops. I would have to apprentice for up to five years, pass at least one examination, and pay hundreds in fees to the state before I could do the same thing and get paid. Why? Occupational licensing. Many jobs now require a government permission slip, otherwise known as an occupational license, just to work. Jobs like locksmith, shampooer, tree trimmer, florist, and hundreds of others. Working without a license can often result in significant fines and even jail time. But it wasn't always this way. In the 1950s, only about 1 in 20 workers needed a license. Today, that number is about 1 in 4. And earning a license can often require significant amounts of time and money. It's no wonder, then, that the issue of occupational licensing has become one of the biggest labor economics issues in the country. And it often plays out in places as simple as your neighborhood barbershop. So June, how much did it cost you to get your barber's license? Well, I think it cost me about $11,000. Oh, and how long did it take? By law, I was required to do a thousand hours of classes. A thousand hours in order to do this, this, and maybe this. Proponents will tell you that licensing is necessary to protect public health and safety. But is it true? We came here to the University of Minnesota, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, to ask the preeminent researcher on licensing, Dr. Morris Kleiner. So Dr. Kleiner, how much evidence is there that licensing actually protects public health and safety? Not very much. There is some evidence, but the preponderance of the evidence suggests that it doesn't do much to protect health and safety. Well, then surely licensing must increase quality of service and weed out charlatans and quacks, right? Well, my work suggests there's uh, virtually no effect on overall quality. Well, if that's the case, then what, what does licensing do? Well, it's great for individuals who are fortunate enough to be licensed. And let me give you an illustration. Okay. Uh, if you view this circle as being an occupation, licensing serves as a fence to keep people out of the occupation. So if someone tries to get in, the expense serves as a barrier to entry. Okay, so then what's the effect? Well, licensing drives up wages and prices for those individuals who are fortunate enough to be licensed. So then people who are kept out, that means there are fewer job opportunities. That's correct, and especially for individuals who are entrepreneurs or individuals who might work for those entrepreneurs. That includes workers on the lower rungs of the economic ladder. Our study, License to Work, examines the licensing requirements for 102 lower income occupations across all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We found that breaking into these jobs takes, on average, almost a year in education and training, passing an exam, and more than $260 in fees. Of course, licensing limits job opportunities. But that's just part of the story. In future episodes, we'll discuss how licenses are often designed to protect licensees from competition, not the public. We'll explore alternatives and suggest reforms that can untangle the red tape of licensing 
to put more Americans back to work. In the meantime, click the link to read our report and subscribe to our channel in order to see future episodes.